All right, um, so it is nine o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we're gonna begin our cloud and coffee session here. We've got our co-hosts, Chris Oglesby and Bill Hunt. And our special guest today is Deborah Jordan. Um, Chris, I will hand it over to you then. Great, thanks Kirsten. And again, thank you for all your, uh, all your assistance and help in getting these scheduled. And welcome everyone. I uh, just wanted to introduce um, the ATAR Cloud and Coffee discussion. My name is Chris Oglesby again with MorphWorks and co-host Bill Hunt with SBA. And we're excited about our uh, 2021 kickoff show and, uh, and our guests. Uh, before the introductions, um, for those of you that may not have been on our inaugural uh, event in December, the ATAR uh, Cloud and Infrastructure Working Group uh, is bringing you this platform kind of with a goal of bringing more lessons learned and ideas to the ATAR community. Uh, our focus is going to be a, a conversation about our guest experiences, past and present in executing modernization and transformation efforts. Um, from a housekeeping standpoint, if audiences could please mute your devices uh, and feel free to enter uh, questions in the chat. Um, we can uh, get to them as, uh, as we go through the conversation. So let's move on to uh, introductions. We have uh, Deb Jordan, the Deputy Chief uh, of Public Safety and Homeland Security uh, at the FCC. Uh, one of the things that uh, is exciting about uh, Deb's experience is she brings a uniqueness to the uh, cloud and coffee uh, uh, discussion today of being both on the mission side uh, and the CIO side. And so we are excited to, uh, to have a, kind of a lessons learned conversation with uh, Deb today. So. Um, I think Bill had a, uh, a, a first question that we were talking about before we got on the air is uh, what everybody is, is uh, um, you know, their, their morning preference. Um, so mine is uh, mine's coffee uh, out of our new Nespresso machine, which is a pretty interesting uh, new model. Business model is, uh, you know, all these little uh, pods that, uh, that you get to choose from. So um, that are all uh, recyclable. So it's a very green uh, approach. So um, Bill, you? Uh, you know, this morning, uh, didn't have a lot of sleep last night as a lot of people, I think. So, um, I went straight for the, uh, the deep end of my black tea collection, got some Assam, uh, going to my mug here, uh, just trying to be relevant and, uh, paying attention this morning. I gotta be honest. It was, it was a bit of a night. Deb, how about you? So I'm going to show off my coffee mug that I got for Christmas. And, um, I have vanilla Mac coffee from Hawaii, uh, with some Starbucks creamer Ooh. added to it. So. Hawaii. It'll keep me going and the couple keep me happy. Oh, awesome. So uh, Deb, let's um, real quick, the, you know, the, the um, use of cloud. So, uh, you know, in your role now in, from a public safety standpoint, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the need for, you know, access to technology, et cetera, um, you know, I guess in your current role as mission and in your previous role is in a, in a mission, um, you know, use of, uh, you know, kind of a decentralized environment and a, you know, a, a cloud environment. How, uh, you know, how has that been a, a, a positive or a negative? So I think um, it's been a, a real positive for us and, and starting as far back as um, two jobs ago, uh, where we were designing kind of our first system. And this is when I was on the providing service to customers. Um, one of the key things that I think as a takeaway is that people really need to look at what they're gonna put into the cloud um, before they just make the move. You know, things like application rationalization, looking at your systems, rationalizing systems as well. Um, some people don't like the term, you know, we fondly called it in the Navy at rat and had little mice sitting on the desks of those people in charge. Um, but I think if you don't do that, you don't get the full benefit of what comes from a cloud, you know, because it's almost a garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you if you want to bring, you know, 50 different versions of spreadsheet capability to a cloud, I guess you could do that and pay for it. Um, but until you really do that rationalization, I don't think you get the true benefits of moving to the cloud. So that's kind of the first aspect of what I would look at. I mean... Uh, obviously, the check is in the mail on that one for you there, Deb. Thank you for uh, for plugging AppRat, which is something that I hit on every time anybody lets me talk. So um, that's always an important one for me, too. You know, I like to tell the anecdote that, um, you know, we had uh, the old cloud first strategy and the government moved very aggressively in some places to move into cloud. And um, at some agencies that will remain nameless for the purposes of this conversation on the record, um, 
they had to actually now do cloud consolidation, not just data center consolidation, because they just lifted and shifted everything and bought every single thing that they could possibly find, every single little subcomponent with a P card, went and bought a whole bunch of different like cloud services and you've got all this duplication, but there wasn't really a measured thoughtfulness to how right. they got the cloud. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, how do you make that determination for you? Like, what are the, the key factors that you think about when it's like keep or kill or modernize? Like what, what's sort of your thought process, you know, from where you're sitting, what's important? So I think um, part of that goes back to kind of a philosophy. And so when I became CIO within one of the Navy organizations, um, one of the key things to me was that all of the business units, all of the, the um, employees, if you will, of our organization, as well as the customers. We were a fee-for-service organization, so we had a lot of customers that came to us. They were customers. Um, they weren't just users over which I could levy my power and my might. And it, it requires partnering, because if you don't partner with the business users, then you're kind of making decisions um, in, uh, in a random manner, in a vacuum, if you will. And without that partnering, you're not making the, the best and the most informed decisions. Um, but probably more importantly in the end is you don't get the buy-in. You know, there is that emotional attachment that people need to have to decisions, especially when there's change. And if you don't get that from them, um, like you're doomed for failure because then you've always done something to them as opposed to doing something with them or for them. And so that is philosophically, I think where it needs to come down to. And, and, it, and the same holds true on the mission side. You know, I'm not the CIO now. When the CIO comes in, there's, there are a number of times that, you know, I get kind of antsy and want to like dig into their business. And, and one of my first comments is I'm not the CIO, um, but I would like to partner and help you. You know, I have a requirement um, I need you to tell me like what tools, you know, like what's the best way to solve this within the tool set that our agency is now endorsing because, you know, the other side of it is not every agency decides on the same tool set, right? Some decide on using Google as a cloud, some decide on Amazon, you know, you might go to Microsoft and, you know, if my favorite was product X and my organization is now using product Z, you know, as a mission user, I have to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing as a CIO coming in. You can, but it's not always wise to do kind of a 100% replacement based on what I did in last job. So a lot of partnering, sorry, long answer, but a lot of partnering uh, with, with between kind of the provider and the mission side of us. Mm -hmm. oh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you for that one because uh, you, you plugged uh, Morpork's, you know, constant statement of you got to work through the emotional side of change that Bill and I talk about a lot in, uh, in our side conversations, but I'm kind of curious, just digging into that a little bit more, you know, once you start the change, once you start the transformation on either side, you know, one of the things that we talk about uh, as, uh, you know, as a professional service consulting firm is, you know, is the advocacy, right? And so, uh, you know, how does, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stop with that first decision. How do you on, on either side, whether you're the mission owner or the, the CIO shop, how do you kind of continue that advocacy? So um, I'm, I'm thinking of some lessons learned sometimes the hard way. And um, <laughs> whenever we're making change, um, don't go for the big bang, you know, um, go for um, soft launches where it makes sense. You know, find the users who, um, who really are gonna benefit from the change and then they can become your best advocates because it's, 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 I hate to say this, but sometimes it's like raising your teenagers that you can tell them, you can tell them, you can tell them, but if you can show them and they can get an emotional attachment, a benefit to, to a specific change that you're bringing about. And so the same thing holds true if, if you're making a change in uh, a software version or a type of software, if you can find um, a business partner that is really gonna benefit from it and you can demonstrate that benefit, um, I think it goes a long way to that person then becoming one of your disciples who goes out and says, hey, this tool is really great. Let me tell you what it saved us either from time uh, or from process or from frustration, for instance. Um, I think a lot of times 
we as CIOs can kind of use the cybersecurity as the fallback. You know, that software is at end of life. I need to patch it. It's going to take this capability away from you. I'm sorry. Um, but if instead you can keep that in your back pocket and say, hey, this is going to make you, you know, more secure, less subject uh, to problems in the future. And oh, by the way, here's a business benefit that you're going to get from it. Um, I think that helps. And the only way you know that business benefit is by partnering with them and really understanding their business, right? Um, because if, if we stay in our, our kind of CIO bubble, and, and really only look at it as, as I'm rolling out technology, it's new and wonderful, and you're going to love it, trust me. Um, then that doesn't kind of give people that emotional attachment, if you will, to the change. And it really only gives you one opportunity for failure there, because once you've proven that it didn't work exactly the way that, you know, they thought, and it doesn't make their teeth whiter and their breath fresher, you know, they're not going to give you that opportunity a second time. Exactly. Um, yeah. So really building that, I mean, that resonates with, you know, my private sector experience of like, you know, you build your evangelists, right? You know, you yes. build sort of like this group of people who believe in the thing that you were doing, you know, and you bring them to the table. Um, and a lot of that ties into, you know, one of my big issues, Chris and I talk about a lot, um, you know, it's about building a culture of change, mm -hmm. you know, it's about building an organization where um, people don't just you know, we, we uh, malign people as, as server huggers, but really it's people, they don't want their things to break, right? At the end of the day, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about your experiences, you know, and, and how you it, it foster that sort of a, a culture of change in an organization, um, how you both, you know, from the CIO side and on the mission side, how you um, equip your people and prepare them for the fact that, I mean, old technology has changed and we are constantly changing now. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I feel like um, my life is a series of lessons learned. Um, I like change. I find that um, when things are really static and, you know, if I have the opportunity and I'm focused on only one thing, um, for me as my personality, that's kind of boring and, um, you know, I'm always looking for what can I do to make things better. And I discovered along the way that not everyone thinks the same way that I do. There are people who really are uncomfortable with change. And um, once I realized, you know, years back, maybe decades back in the career, um, that that change makes people really uncomfortable, um, then you realize that you really, again, have to find out, like, what is it about the current situation that is comforting to them? What is it? And and. I say comforting, not to be disrespectful, but from a, here's how I do my business. What is it that, that they're really attached to? And if you can find a common thread and say, you know, we're still gonna do that, but here's how I think you might like this better. So, you know, you're still gonna have coffee in the morning, but you know, I got this one that came all the way from Hawaii, try it, it's really great. Um, and so I think finding, again, what is it that makes the people that are going to be the users of the new capability, the new system, the new process, um, again, get their buy-in because again, if you don't, you're doing something to them, not for or with them. And, and you know, the same thing goes on, whether it's with cloud, whether it's with a new computer. I mean, it could just be a new operating system that comes out and everybody says it's intuitive, but that button I used to click on isn't there anymore. What do I do now, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so envisioning all of your um, kind of varied scale of people and, and what their concerns are, I think you have to address those. So, you know, that you bring up an interesting point, right? Coffee from Hawaii, I, I mean, I've, uh, I've been in uh, on, just to kind of tie back, you know, the, to the coffee of been trying local roasters, right? We've got a nice uh, small small one in Vienna. There's uh, one in DC that I like. There's one down in Alexandria, one up, up near Baltimore. And, and, you know, in a lot of uh, the industries, it's, it's becoming the sampling, the, the, the piloting. I, I think one of the things that, you know, is, is um, having worked for a state, having worked, uh, um, you know, worked with um, the federal government, you know, the, the, the piloting is, is not something that it's it's discussed, it's pushed, it's thought about, um, but it, it it isn't fully embraced yet. I don't know if it's not fully embraced because of the acquisition side or uh, or what in in a, in a lot of industries. But have you ever 
you know, from a technology standpoint, uh, done, you know, a pilot to be able to, to get that sample, right? The, you know, the, the Costco, everybody goes to, you know, Costco at lunchtime because you know you're going to get all those samples, right? But, hey, you know, have, have, you, have, you, have you experienced or, or, or approached, uh, you know, kind of that, that change with, you know, kind of the sampling aspect? So I have, and um, I probably will talk about two different um, instances. And one is um, something that is happening actually in my current position where we're rolling out a new business capability um, um, that will kind of change what we've been doing by email and instead go with an automated system. And what the CIO shop did was basically create a system, um, but then only rolled it out to two different users, not the whole agency and said, let's try it out. Let's soft launch it. Let's see how it works. Let's fine tune it. Um, and so I'm using it operationally and giving them feedback and, you know, it's already in production, um, but, but we fine tune the pieces as we go, if you will. Um, and the process and then decide, do we roll it out to everyone or do, do we only keep it with the people who really need that capability most often and leave the others with email because maybe that's what they're comfortable with. So we're, we're in that decision process right now, um, but probably more related to technology. A couple jobs back, we were, um, I was fortunate to set up almost kind of a greenfield um, data warehouse, setting up some business analytics on top of it, doing some kind of automated enterprise performance management tools, if you will. Um, and as part of that, we wanted a collaborative environment where everything would be kind of in a portal that you could search just for our organization. And um, we did pilot, uh, we were using, looking at different search capabilities. And so we were able to work with our acquisition folks to pilot some capabilities um, try them out with, again, a small set of users, broaden it, um, before we made a decision to actually invest in a long-term um, either purchase or lease of the capability. So there are some um, fairly creative ways that if you work with the acquisition folks, drag in the legal beagles because they have to be there, um, that you can actually pilot capabilities before you make a firm decision to launch and and sometimes it's helpful, sometimes, you know, it turns into a bust, but, um, uh, and I'll give you kind of one third example of what we're doing. Uh, in my current job, we um, do some data analytics on um, a variety of things relative to what's the status of what's going on in, in the networks around the country, right? Uh, and we don't have staff for it. So we bring in a set of interns every term and uh, do pilots of looking at different things, um, you know, uh, different uh, social media, for instance. Does social media tell us that there are problems with the internet or something like that? And so through these uh, series of pilots, we can then determine, do we want to actually formally introduce a certain kinds of data into our thought structure? I'm, I, I really would like to hear more about this to, to drill down a little bit. I mean, the, the concept of bringing in interns to uh, run these pilots and like figure out what's going on. I mean, that's something that we did in, you know, again, the private sector, you know, we'd have like dev teams and we'd be like, go figure out how this new shiny technology thing works. Like, you know, back in those days, it was like, well, uh, we hear containerization might become a thing. Why don't you all uh, go do that research project for a few months? So how do you have that working in the federal government? How does that actually, can you describe the shape of it a little bit more? Talk through the, the yeah, steps. So, um... So, so there are a number of um, schools and, you know, we, uh, I can't go into a lot of the details because I'm not actually the one who's recruiting them, but I know that uh, one of my folks on our team um, somehow has the word out, gets a number of interns who um, apply for one or two term sessions with us. And I think what is key that has made him successful in doing this is, there is a structure that every one of them follows and it starts with kind of uh, a PowerPoint briefing that says, here's who I am, here's a project I'm working on, here's who my sponsor is because there needs to be a business owner to what you're doing. You can't just like study data for the sake of studying data. Um, and here's the expected outcome. 
And probably most importantly, here's my methodology. So here's how I'm, you know, I'm gonna, either I'm gonna research or I'm gonna pull data. Um, and at the end, they deliver as finished a product as possible. And if there is code that goes with it, that code is turned over um, and the next steps are laid out so that in the following term, that exact same project gets picked up. So intern number two says, hi, I'm intern number two working on this. And oh, by the way, intern number one, you might remember Bill Hunt worked on it last term and he delivered this. And what I'm going to do is and I'll take it to this step. And I think doing that constant methodology and having that handoff has allowed us to mature the program because prior to that, kind of get an intern who comes in, does something cool, they leave. And then it was really cool, but you know what? Nobody's using it now because you kind of forgot about it. And there's nobody to pick it up because the whole reason you have these interns is not only to give them an opportunity, um, but to do something that we otherwise might not have had the resources to do. And so it's not so much an augmentation of our budget, but the ability to do research into areas uh, that we don't know yet, are they gonna pan out? So I think it's been a plus for us. Um, and, 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 you know, even in prior jobs, having interns come in, give them something meaningful, uh, and then make sure you take what they do and hand it off to someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, another uh, way that I've seen people go about it. There's um, at GSA, they're running their 10x program, which I also think is, is analogous and fascinating, where they'll invest a little bit of money into trying out, you know, a new thing, a new idea. You know, they did one on um, RPA not too long ago, I think, mm -hmm. and AI and chatbots, et cetera. Um, and they have different tiers of investment. Um, so, you know, if it looks like it pans out at this introductory, we Googled it level, um, you know, it goes to the next level. And then from there, we're going to try a little tiny documentation thing. And then we're going to try a little tiny pot and, and moving up the chain, you know? So I really like this idea of um, not overly investing uh, yeah. in something up front, right? You want to you test it a little bit and kick the tires as, as you try it out. Um, and part of that for me is just shell shock of knowing like something that uh, was supposed to be just a prototype quickly finds its way into production. Uh, if you don't have really clear, you know, guardrails around that to make sure that, yeah, yeah. or yeah. gets abandoned even worse, yeah. That, uh, that, that actually lends, uh, lends it to, and I think one of the things that we talked about, and there's a, there's a question here that, um, you know, is, is tied to kind of culture and, and uh, the acceptance of uh, moving to cloud infrastructure. But, you know, we probably skipped past it. And, and uh, it's, it's one that I think that, you know, we as a company see and Bill and I've had, and we've talked about it in our working groups is, it's kind of the, you know, the strategy, right? So, so laying out, I mean, you, you've got the ability of having, you know, an approach of working, you know, cross aisle, but you know, in the in this kind of the overarching strategy, um, probably much like uh, you know, much like uh, with the interns, you know, um, where does, does this culture and and kind of that that change management come up first? Does it you know, and and kind of the hurdles that you have to get to, um, you know, kind of in your experience of uh, of kind of moving um, to uh, to a cloud environment, which you know, again, may may gray out that button you're used to clicking, right? So I, I guess from a strategy standpoint, um, you know, how does how does that fit? Um, so so I think there's um, a couple things to think about, and and I'll I'll go kind of to one example of a situation I had where we were looking at building a capability, expanding something we had, but really building a capability that was going to potentially grow the number of users depending on how many projects we had, uh, who they were for. It could end up being um, um, a sudden spike in number of users and then it could kind of tamp down depending on the number of major projects or a wide variety of small projects going on. Um, and, and that, um, served to um, be an example of a system that made sense to move into the cloud because it was gonna allow us to scale up, scale down. Uh, it was gonna allow us to look at cost of software. Uh, do we need to share that cost uh, among some of our customers? How do we, how do, we do those kinds of things? And so um, 
when we looked overall at the cost of ownership, total cost of ownership for that system um, and did that business case, it made sense to be one of the first candidates that we moved to a true cloud, um, hate to admit, probably a decade or so ago. And, and I think in looking at the strategy of how do you make those decisions, I think it has to be kind of a business case assessment of is the benefit there both from a cost and a performance perspective, right? Because cost isn't, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of kind of low cost um, analysis, if you will. I recognize that cost is a factor, um, but the business has to benefit from it as well. And so in that case, it made sense because uh, one, we were gonna be able to stand up the capability quickly, and two, we were gonna be able to scale it up and down rapidly as well. Um, one of the things that, that I think I, I wanna make a point about also is that as we make these decisions to move to the cloud, um, I thought naively a, a while back um, in a prior job that as you move to the cloud, you automatically get security with that, right? You know, your cloud hoster is going to perform. All your cybersecurity functions and patches are required. And um, that's something I think people have to look at very closely, you know, that it's not an automatic. And, and people have to draw the lines on where do you want, who doing what aspects of your security? Because we talk about uh, security in depth and all kinds of aspects of doing um, making sure that your, especially your public facing applications are secure. And if that's not explicitly clear from the outset, um, I think you're doomed for failure at some point. You know, you may skate by and you may be secure by obscurity, um, but um, everybody remembers kind of the, the Navy problem with the Iranians in their networks back in 2014. Um, as we were cleaning up and thankfully this wasn't necessarily one of the systems that, that was compromised, but as we were cleaning up and had to take all our systems down, and then you had to meet certain criteria before you brought them back up, we found out that, oh golly gee, the host for that system wasn't doing security. We thought they were, so we weren't doing it. Uh, and so bringing it back up was a much longer process because now you have a system that basically was violating all of the cyber, not all, but a large number of cybersecurity policies. And as you implemented the policies, of course, the system breaks. And so that's a little bit of a plug for make sure you know um, what your security requirements are going in, because uh, otherwise you'll design your system uh, around security and it won't work. So, I mean, uh, you've already mentioned two of my big three uh, when it comes to cloud stuff. And so I'd like to, to dig in on, on cybersecurity for a little while here while we have everybody. Obviously, extraordinarily relevant topic given everything that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Um, how do you manage all of this risk at the end of the day? I mean, I, I, I guess I shouldn't say uh, while I'm being recorded that FISMA is completely broken, but FISMA is uh, definitely a struggle for agencies and how we... Um, balance risk with innovation or, you know, how we're actually, um, you know, doing business. And we do make a lot of assumptions as the federal government that we can buy our way out of risk by handing it over to a private company. And um, we've learned time and time again, that's just not true. Um, you know, from identity company breaches, from the most recent uh, network breaches that we saw this past week, um, it's hard. There's a, there's a, a lot of moving pieces there. Um, what, how do you balance these things? You know, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and I'm, I'm trying not to be political about this or, or calling out any specific vendor, um, but you know, we've got some of the biggest cloud companies in the world right now still sell, um, storing American data uh, you know, on Chinese soil, on Iranian soil. Um, you know, how do we make that sort of a balance when the vendors don't necessarily even jump through the hoops that we want them to? Um, how do you make the decisions above and beyond just what we are required to by NIST 853? Um, how do you find that balance? How do you um, decide for you where your risk profile sits? And I know that this is probably a, a topic that's been beaten to death. But I think it's important to talk about. Oh, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, like I apologize. <laughs> if you, uh, need, a, if you need a drink of coffee first, it's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, you need to get into the happy cup. Uh, if, for those of you that don't know, 
uh, Deb did uh, disclose that uh, there's reindeer and Santa, you know, circling the inner side of her cup. So it, uh, I think it gives her a little motivation for, for this question. <laughs> So, so I'd like to say, um, go out and hire a really great CISO and then sit back and let him or her do their job. Their um, problem then, you don't have to worry about it. You yeah. just hit the answer. easy button. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the easy button and, and you have this little guillotine sitting there as a motivation for them. But no, seriously, um, I found that that doesn't actually work because, um, uh, because as you know, as, as you go through and, and you get accreditation for your system and, and you do continuous monitoring and, and certain things have to happen on a recurring basis. Um, an, a lot of times, if, if you're not paying close attention to uh, what the status is of, you know, it could be an actual authority to operate or it could be uh, patches or it could be any aspect of, of the security posture of your um, IT systems and infrastructure, there are an almost or seemingly infinite number of things that you could measure for compliance and level of compliance, right? Because, um, you know, do you have any criticals? Do you have any highs? Do you have any moderates? Do you have any lows? The answer is yes. You're always gonna have something outstanding, something that is not 100% in compliance. And the question becomes, what's your tolerance? You know, clearly you don't want to tolerate criticals or highs. What about mediums? How many of them can you tolerate? Um, and I think a lot of it boils down to um, the business risk has to be managed with your security risk. And um, I am thankful not to be owning that in, in this current day because um, the world has gotten um, scarier and um, uh, you know, the, the, the impacts are, are more severe certainly than they were uh, 10, 15 years ago. But I think it is a balance of business risk with security risk. And I think, again, it goes back to partnering with the business owners, the business line owners, because um, a while back, and, and this is uh, you know, a handful of jobs ago, I naively thought you have a CISO staff, they're responsible for all aspects of cybersecurity and accreditation. Why isn't the work getting done? And then you realize that it's a partnering. It is the business and system owners who have to contribute uh, and tell you things like how they're using the system, what it's for, what the business risks are, who the customers are, what the environment is that they need to operate in. Um, you know, we had a system that had to almost be completely redesigned uh, because we didn't define upfront the different categories of users and where they were gonna be accessing the data from, right? Uh, are all of your users accessing your data inside the confines of your intranet or are they coming from the outside? Are you going to let customers as access any aspect of that data? And if the answer is yes, and you need to, for instance, partition the data, because you know what? Only the HR folks get to see this data. The employee gets to see this. Their supervisor gets to see this. And the general population gets to see, you know, an aggregated demographic table. Um, you know, that's a big change to, to PII data handling. And so, I think all of those um, partnering discussions that we talked about are really important in making those strategic decisions on how you handle risk and how much you're willing to share. Uh, and then, you know, CIO needs to put on, you know, kind of the big boy and girl britches and make those decisions sometimes because um, there is a trade off and you're never going to be 100% secure. Yeah, you know, it actually, uh, we've got a question here uh, uh, from Robert, and and uh, a little bit of it, I think, ties back to um, the early conversation around what you were just talking about, right? The the, the partnership, and and Robert's asking, you know, uh, how do you help decision makers with the muscle memory approach and uh, going with uh, legacy solutions and testing and working with new technology solutions? We talked a little bit about Robert. Uh, you might have missed it, uh, piloting, but. You know, I think in, in this case, right, it's even the same. In the risk management world, there is a muscle memory um, that has to be created broader than just like you're saying. It, it, it can't be just, um, you know, just the, the, the change. And Robert goes on to talk about, you know, the, 
the speed and scale of which technology is changing, uh, you know, I, I have a belief and we corporately have a belief that, you know, that it's a, a, a upon all of us, right? That we can't just, you know, expect one person to take care of it. But how do you, you know, how do you best approach that when I, I do believe there is a um, propensity to, to think, well, technology is just going to solve it. Um, so the, the partnering is a, is a good one, but, you know, I, I, I like this uh, question from Robert on the the muscle memory approach, mm -hmm. right? How do you get, how do you get people to, you know, the, the partnering starts and, and Robert, uh, what you heard was, you know, a discussion about, um, you might've missed is a discussion about, you know, the pilots and, and kind of starting them off and then making decisions on where to go from there. But, um, you know, maybe we can expand on that a little bit. Um, I can, and I'm a big believer in frameworks and framework, that term means different things to different people, but uh, for me, frameworks creates a repeatable structure uh, that people use to accomplish things. And, and from a cybersecurity perspective, and especially when you uh, talk about kind of building the muscle memory in folks, um, a while back, I had a situation where a number of our systems were either coming or overdue for um, either an annual or biannual uh, certifications that were required. And um, we kept getting kind of these vague answers of, you know, well, it, it's going to be in a week or it's going to be in a month. And, and, you know, you've got 30 systems and they all have moving targets. Um, and so it started with something as simple as a spreadsheet that said, here are the X number of steps. Steps one through three each take, you know, five days. And et cetera, and, and you kind of build a spreadsheet. Uh, and then it morphed into, oh, I shouldn't have said morph. Uh, <laughs> it evolved. Hey, I hear it works. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it did morph into a working product um, where there was a target number of days, who was responsible for it, and where were their interdependencies? And it, it kind of sounds like I was building, you know, almost like a project plan in a, in a project tool. Um, but what it really amounted to was, yes, it was kind of a project plan, uh, but then it became a framework where if it, if there were, um, steps that were done outside the, the CISO shop, you know, in either the application programmer and developer shop or the business owner, um, then you got everybody together in a meeting and said, you know, your system, uh, you know, and this is where you kind of put on the heavy hat, if you will, um, your system is going to get taken offline uh, at this point down the road if we don't accomplish these things and we all need a partner to do it. Okay. And, you know, you develop that partnership. And the first time, um, it's kind of like building behavior and building culture. Uh, the first time it's rough and, and you walk through the steps and you micromanage it. And, and maybe the second time you do that also. Um, but if you can build as much consistency into the framework so that you're looking at involving the right people, establishing target dates, monitor things on a weekly, monthly, whatever basis makes sense. Um, then I like to think some of that muscle memory kicks in so that even if the technology changes, you still know you're going through certain steps. It might be that you change out the name of the product. You might even change the, the name of the criteria and you might even change the process. But the fact that you're going through a framework and building the who, what, when, and where uh, and deciding, and, and as a manager, I kind of have a general rule, you know, things that are, are gonna be done in two weeks, I kind of want uh, updates more frequently things that are, have a, a year milestone, uh, I might look for quarterly or monthly until we come down to the run. You, you keep hitting on a couple of things for me that, that just resonate so much. And I just wanna kind of jump out of my chair every time you say them um, and just like start applauding. Uh, I have to be honest here, particularly, you know, this concept about like, it is a partnership, right? At the end of the day, um, historically, we kind of think of like, you know, the CIO who sits over there and like tells you what to do or the CISO who shows up once every three years to audit your security controls. Um, and then otherwise it's pretty like, you know, they're just not there, um, but it is a partnership. And, you know, again, IT does underlie everything that we do here. Um, 
since we are finally starting to move away from this, like, let's just do a security audit every three years of our security controls and moving sort of this ongoing sort of process. Um, I personally have found, and this is another Trixie question, I apologize. Uh, I personally have found that like, what a program office says that they're going to do with the tool and how the tool actually ends up being used over time as things mature, let's say mature, um, tends to shift and you have a, a difference from the original requirements and what actually ends up happening. Um, how do you stay with that? How can you best foster that relationship so that there's the ongoing conversation um, so that everybody understands, you know, how things are moving, how needs are changing, um, instead of it just being, I, I won't say an antagonistic relationship, but less of a partnership. How do you keep it past launch date um, to keep that conversation going throughout the, the life cycle of um, any solution? So, so I think um, that partnership that I talked about is, is not a one-time. It's not a, um, oh, you need a new system. We have to partner on this. Or it's not a, your system is coming up for its, you know, whatever certification, let's partner on this. I think it's a, it's, like I said, it's an ongoing. And um, so, what I experienced was, for instance, a CIO needs a budget. And if you're in a revenue generating organization, whether it's a private sector or whether it's a government fee for service, or even if you're not a fee for service, um, really the CIO is looked at as you're, you're kind of taking money away from everybody else. Because if your budget wasn't so big, um, I could get a little bit more for X, right? And in the organization I was in um, previously, it was a fee for service. And so, yeah, you know, I'm overhead and I'm driving up rates for, you know, um, public works, for instance, right? Um, and so being in that partnership with the customer and really understanding how they do business and how they're using those systems is important. Um, I think the other thing is CIOs need to listen. And, and that sounds kind of silly, but it's like you sit in, you know, we call them department head meetings where all of the business lines are sitting there, you know, with the CIO and the business manager and the HR director and the commander or your CEO head of your organization. And you need to hear where their pain points are, you know, and especially if they say something like, well, the system doesn't give me that capability or the report gets formatted that way and I, so I can't get that information out of it. It's like, that's a sign to go talk to the, the business owner and say, I heard you say, you know, not in the meeting, but afterwards it's like, hey, Bill, I heard you say that, you know, the report's not giving you the information. Is it because you don't have the data? Or do we just need to like give you a different formatted report? You know, do we need to maybe give them some, some ad hoc analytic capabilities so that they can pull the data in, in the ways they want? So, so I think that is a, an ongoing uh, relationship that people have to have with their business owners. So if I could just follow up on that too real quick. Um, you, you, you did touch on one thing for me that is a hot button issue, I think, in any government agency today, uh, which is the budget side, right? Um, people do feel like that, you know, the CIO shop is cutting out, you know, a piece of their budget. Can you talk a little bit, I mean, obviously we've had Klinger Co. and now Fatara, um, that more cements that relationship between the CFO and the CIO. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, that relationship and how that budget process should be most effective from where you're sitting um, and, and how that can kind of tip the tide a little bit so people don't feel like they're just having their budgets cut out from under them? So, so I can um, give you kind of a couple different models that I've seen in organizations, you know. Um, there are some where the entire um, IT budget is advocated for by the CIO um, and, and, you know, justified and, and therefore allocated. And, and it is a partnership between the CIO and the CFO. And you have to convince the CFO that those monies are, are really required. And then you have to show that they're spent in the right categories for accountability, right? Um, there's, there's another kind of hybrid model, if you will, that yes, all IT dollars have to be identified, right, uh, as such, but the business owners are advocating 
for the allocation associated with their respective systems. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's more, I was gonna say a group hug, but that sounds uh, like not the right uh, picture just, that I want to Just smaller in. knives probably. Right, yeah. right. Especially it's not- a technological, a technological group hug. Thank you because you know <laughs> it's COVID time. Um, but I think that that has value. And even in the situation where I was a CIO, I quote, owned all of the IT personnel and the IT budget, it still required that as part of the budgeting process, all of the business line owners were involved in that. And so there was some preparation that I did in advance. And I went to each of the business owners and said, here's what's gonna come up. And of my, you know, I don't know, pick a number, you know, X million or billion dollar budget, this is what's allocated for each of your systems for the maintenance, for the upgrade, for whatever is gonna be required. And oh, by the way, we have that, you need this capability to develop in the coming year. And um, that's what that set aside for. And if you can identify, and, and what I tried to do is break down my entire budget into each of the business lines. And there is this tiny little amount that is really for the CIO's overhead, if you will. Um, I think that goes a longer way than just the CIO and CFO having the secret handshake. So can, can I uh, uh, kind of dig in on both of you on this? Because I, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, we see, again, from, from a corporate standpoint, and I know Bill and I've uh, talked about this around Apparat, is, you know, collecting, collecting the data, right? And, and so many, uh, you know, um, uh, vendors and products talk about the data that they're collecting. And, and I think, we're, you know, to, to use the garbage in, garbage out, right, you have the issue of, bad data in is, is, you know, bad data, that, you know, to make decisions off of. But, you know, how in, in kind of this world of continuous monitoring in anything, right, I think whether it be from a risk management standpoint, from a, uh, you know, from a version standpoint, from an end of life standpoint, from just a, a financial standpoint, how do you, um, on our, you know, environments using data and continuously evolving that data because I, I, I do think we still have and, and I think it's more human nature than anything else a propensity to point in time create um, and then work off of that and and I don't want to say that we need to get into the you know every minute of every hour we need to be collecting and reanalyzing etc but how do you really leverage the the data and evolve the data um, to really make the best decisions and make quicker decisions because again but to Robert's point, the speed at which technology is, is coming out, the speed at which things are, are happening, not by choice of, of the clients, but by choice of the vendors. How do you, you, know, how do you kind of you know, manage all of that, uh, um, that data for decision? So I think of um, a couple of different aspects of that. And one is um, if I could advocate for people to invest in doing an enterprise architecture study, that really looks at, and especially before <laughs> you make a decision to move like things en masse into a cloud, um, because you're gonna find invariably that there are redundancies in collection of data, incompatibilities. Uh, you know, there might be two different or three different, pick a number, a business line that are collecting um, address data. And they could be collecting it in different formats. You know, are you storing it as a text field? Are you putting numbers in a number field? Are you storing a street name? Are you doing any validation on it? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, what about name? What about, you know, what about, what about, right? Um, and doing an enterprise architecture study, if it's done well, um, you'll find where you have data, where you have commonality, who's using that data, and where do you have data, my favorite, that is an island. You collect it, but nobody ever goes to it, right? Um, and then why are you saving it? Um, um, so that's kind of one piece and, and that's kind of a, a little soapbox for me because I feel like um, when you don't have an enterprise view of it, it's so hard to manage. And, and if you don't do it as an organized study, if you will, um, and you try to do it one by one, there's so many moves, moving pieces that it's just mind boggling. Um, the other thing that I would point out is, um, and I just lost that thought. 
Um, so I'll leave you with enterprise architecture uh, and I'll come back to it when, when my mind brings it back to me. <laughs> uh, feel free to jump in with uh, whenever it, it comes back to you. But uh, as a chief enterprise architect, I certainly appreciate the focus on enterprise architecture. Um, you know, and oh, I, feel like I have it. Go. So the other thing, uh, Chris, you were asking, you know, how do you make decisions with data, those kinds of things. And so as part of that architecture, and I think as you're um, looking and working with your business owners, I think people need to, um, as part of deciding how much data you store and how you access it, um, look at what kinds of business decisions you're going to want to make with that data. And so as part of uh, a, um, a project uh, where I was setting up business analytics, uh, we really needed to look at, so you've got these um, years of data of pick whatever it is, performance, or let, let's just say it's demographics of, of the people that you hire. Let's use that as an example. Um, and so you could end up, if you have a large organization with lots of data that if you don't um, plan ahead, anytime anybody wants to do anything, it's gonna take five minutes to load that data, right? And so you really need to look at how you're going to use that data to one, define what do you need to save and for how long, what increments do you wanna look at it in and how do you really wanna report out on it? Because if they're going to do certain things every day, every week, every month, by golly, give them a canned report and let them push the magic button. Uh, but if, if it's a, a business analytics team that says, I really want to what if this, you know, then work with them, set up, you know, whether you want to call them cubes or schemas or, or whatever you want to create, um, but set them up for them so that one, you facilitate it. And then two, if, if they really want all the raw data, just prepare them. This may take a little while to load, you know, unless you want to bring me in, you know, some quantum computing, you've got all this data. I can let you have at it, but it's going to take you a while. And, and so kind of to the manage the expectations along the way, if you will. I, I certainly appreciate um, putting data architecture at the forefront, having worked at a couple of large agencies that I won't call out in public, um, you know, where exactly the address problem you're talking about, you've got legacy systems where people have been collecting in their own little silos data, you know, your address appears in one agency's data set in 14 different places, and you can't update it all in one place as a customer, you mm -hmm. know, for the American people, that's really frustrating. Um, you know, and I think that also goes back to the, the partnership aspects that you're talking about, you know, like emphasizing human centered design so that you're actually thinking about what your customer is trying to do with the data, both your internal customer and your external customers, you know, how they're trying to treat it. Um, and I probably could talk for another hour and a half on that one. And I, but I really want to come back to one of the things that you had mentioned earlier on. It's it, it, another one of my big three um, was the acquisition piece. You you mentioned it briefly. Um, obviously, uh, you know, cybersecurity is very hard. Data management is very hard. But um, a lot of agencies are still struggling also with just the acquisition piece. Like we want to do all of these new things. We want to do all these new technologies. And quite frankly, we want to buy them in a completely new way. Um, there's a whole new concept around, you know, what your SLAs have to look like, going back to the cybersecurity aspect, what logs you have to get access to. Um, what have you seen successful in bringing the acquisition side of the house along on this journey? Um, you know, making them become, uh, you know, helpful and possibly even evangelists. Um, how, talk about the relationship building there a little bit. Ooh. That, uh, is that too um, hard? I mean, we've only got a few. Uh, no, so no, I it's not hard. It's and, not yeah, hard. Yeah, that's, 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 that's right. That, that's what he asked at, uh, at 953. <laughs> it, um, it is something that, um, that you need to be strategic and thoughtful about because sometimes acquisition shops uh, organize in, in different manners, right? So you could have uh, acquisition folks who are assigned to specific business lines so that they really understand your business and how you're trying to do uh, work. And, and if you have a team that is dedicated to supporting the CIO acquisitions, then they really understand technology and those kinds of things um, and how the market is evolving. You might have another group that's organized by tiers. And if you're buying this much, 
you get this team. And if you're buying this much, you get a different team, right? And, and in those cases, uh, they're certainly familiar with the thresholds, but they may not be familiar with how some of the flexibilities and how you buy technology. And so I think a lot of it, again, I go to partnering and I've had to do that because um, I worked in a situation where um, it was almost first in, first out, you know, you kind of got the next person who was available to help with your acquisition, had no background in what you had done in the past. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, there are people who want to tell you what you can't do as opposed to explore what you can do. And so um, in many cases, it does take kind of the CIO partnering with your head of contracting to say, hey, what's in this for us as an organization is to be able to do this smartly. Um, and so I need you to kind of bring the creative brains because technology is something that is evolving so quickly, not just the technology, but the rules for how we buy things and, and you know, the rules for what you can't buy, right? You know, supply chain has said you can't buy certain things. And so it does, again, take that partnering so that they assign you people uh, who are willing to work with you through those challenges. So, I, you know, I think it's, it, it's a perfect point. I, I also believe that there is a, a challenge. It's, and I don't think this is just a government challenge. I think it's, you know, large, large, uh, uh, corporations have the same challenge, right? And I and I do believe that uh, what I have seen work the best is the um, you know the the partnership model, right? Where there is a a business manager, so to speak, um, uh, tied to it. But you know, I've always had this belief also that that there's you know this challenge, and, and I think the government has it, it. It's the worst because of the way things happen, right? So you have an enterprise architecture, you know, that 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 is laid out. But you have a budget that's on, you know, on kind of three to five year cycles that, you know, you're, you're working towards. And then you have RFPs that, you know, are tied to some portion in, of that budget along the way, but may not necessarily be tied to the enterprise architecture. So to, to kind of keep up with the speed, you kind of end up doing what you did five years ago or 10 years ago when you, when you last released it. And, and I think that's, that's just getting hard, I think, in, in general, right, especially from a from a, a technology standpoint, um, you know, and I think the, the, the one thing that's interesting is looking at, at some of these different um, aspects of, of acquisition, kind of tying back to how we started around pilots, like the OTAs, et cetera, that I think that that's a way that, you know, the, the, the GSA organizations that, you know, that are looking for the innovation, but acquisition has to be tied to that as well, right, versus just um, the technology piece. Agree, and it, it is difficult. Um, the government budget process, you know, where you have the programming, palming budget, you know, trying to pr predict things uh, years in advance of what you're going to need. And, and it is really part art and part science because you have to be true at the same time. You can't predict three years in advance exactly how you're going to spend your money. And so there is some programming uh, flexibility that you have to, to work with. Um, and, and, you know, working with acquisition tools that allow you to um, do procurements quickly is key because um, things that take, you know, a year or three years to, to go from start to end are, are um, building obsolescence into what you, you buy and develop, so. Well, I think we're uh, coming to the close. Um, I don't know, Bill, if you have one last question, but I do want to make an announcement for everybody that our, our uh, next uh, Cloud and Coffee will be on uh, January 21st, uh, uh, same ATARC uh, time, same ATARC channel, um, for those of you that are old Batman fans. Um, and uh, Mike Cassidy will be our guest. So um, I do want to say, Deb, thank you very much for sharing your lessons learned for our community. And, uh, Thanks for having me. All right, thank you guys. Um, can all of our panelists smile real quick so I can take a screenshot? <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Deb. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Kirsten, and thank you everybody for joining. Thank you all so much. All right, take care. Have a good week. Stay safe. You too.